Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight. Six to celebrate a uh, tour of Todd Hill, Duncan Hills. This is, uh, uh, Todd Hill, Duncan Hills is located in Staten Island. We will be doing um, more Six to Celebrate tours as we always do. And we have plenty more on our YouTube channel as well as our website, hdc.org. Uh, you can also find out more information about this Six to Celebrate and all of our other Six to Celebrate groups on our other website, sixtocelebrate.org. We have walking tour brochures of all the neighborhoods up to 2016, I believe. Uh, so you can download the PDFs or you can purchase the physical brochures and, you know, take nice little walks around the neighborhood. It's been very nice. Uh, I took one of Jackson Heights the other day. We have open street on 34th Avenue and it's lovely. So please feel free to enjoy those. And if you have any questions, you can always email hdc at hdc.org. And with that, I will hand it over to our tour guides. Hello, I'm Jean Prabhu uh, from the Dungan Hills neighborhood. When I was asked to host a tour of my beautiful neighborhood, I envisioned a perfect day where I would take a walk through my neighborhood pointing out all of the lovely homes and this what I consider to be one of New York City's best kept secrets. Since the walking tour uh, was originally planned, the structures included are those which could mostly be in walking distance of one another. You could actually walk to these um, if you wanted to. Um, if I erred by including or excluding uh, any particular structure or home, I'll just ask my neighbors of uh, forgiveness. And I want them all to know that this was done to celebrate our rich history and the beauty of our historic structures. Because of COVID-19, my dream of an in-person tour was not to be. So I enlisted the help of friends and family to showcase our historic treasures in this virtual tour. So thanks to Jane McGrady, a great friend and an architect with a special interest in New York City history. And thanks to my daughter Mimi, who despite a full teaching schedule compensated for my lack of technical prowess and uh, set up the PowerPoint. And thanks of course to HDC and Michelle um, for asking me to do this. I really appreciate it. Uh, Toad Hill, is a 401 foot tall hill formed of serpentine rock on Staten Island. It's the highest point in the five boroughs of New York City and the highest elevation for the entire coastal plain from Florida to Cape Cod. The summit of the ridge is largely woods known as the Staten Island Greenbelt. A Dungan Hills borders Toad Hill on the Northwest but in researching, I found that several older homes, while they may now be said to be located in Toad Hill, were once said to be located in Dongan Hills. For example, the Charles Jarvis Fay House, uh, which we're going to visit uh, on Roma Road, might be said to be located in Toad Hill, but his biography states that his residence uh, was located in Dongan Hills. For me, it's hard to describe where Toad Hill stops and Dungan Hills begins. And if you ask five different Staten Islanders, you may find yourself with five different answers. Mm -hmm. In any event, those of us who are privileged to live here are in agreement that the beauty of the hills transcends boundaries. Just a little bit of history because most of it we're gonna learn through the structures with, with Jane's help. Um, the name Toad comes from the German word for dead, which is thought to refer to the Moravian Cemetery, which has been used since colonial days. We're going to visit uh, the Moravian Cemetery on the tour. Uh, the name Dungan Hills was for uh, Thomas Dungan, the Irish-born governor of the province of New York. The area was first inhabited in the late 1600s by the Garretson family and was originally known by that name of Garrison, but the name was changed to avoid confusion with Garrison on Hudson. The Bilio Stillwell Perrine House, which is the oldest house on Staten Island dating from 1663, uh, is located 
um, in Dongan Hills. We will visit this treasure on the tour and learn about its fascinating history, including its friendly ghost. So now uh, let's start the tour where we can learn so much more history in the context of the structures. And so I'll turn this over to Jane, who's going to teach us so much about this. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank uh, HDC, Simeon Bankoff, and Michelle Arbelou, and mostly Jean Prabhu, who did all the legwork on this. And I just uh, sort of put a little polish on it. So um, we can get started with the uh, first slide. Um, and so any tour of walking tour of Toad Hill has to start with Ernest Flagg. He was born in Brooklyn in 1857 to Connecticut Yankees. His father, Jared Flagg, was a clergyman, a land developer, an accomplished portrait painter. As a young man, Ernest worked with his father um, in the real estate business and developed a talent and an interest in architecture. He had a first cousin, Alice Claypool Gwynn, who was married to Cornelius Vanderbilt II, the grandson of the Commodore. And Vanderbilt thought Ernest had talent, so he arranged for him to spend two years at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. There were no architecture schools at the time, and so young men went abroad to learn architecture. Flagg came home with his head full of examples of Greek, Roman, medieval, Renaissance styles of architecture and planning. One of his first projects was St. Luke's Hospital on Morningside Heights. He won a commission and created a very handsome and functional hospital. You can see the hallmarks of the Beaux-Arts. There's a base, there's a middle, there's a, an elaborate roof and a central tower. Ernest was also fortunate to have some good connections, one of which was Frederick Gilbert Horn, who was the president of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Flagg designed the first skyscraper in New York for the company, which sadly was demolished in 1968. He also designed an enormous Long Island mansion for Bourne, as well as a castle on an island in the St. Lawrence River. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, in 1896, the US Naval Academy in Annapolis selected Flag to do a master plan for their, their campus. The overall plan and his subsequent campus buildings are one of the few examples of French Renaissance architecture in the United States. The lovely chapel on the left is one of the highlights of the campus. In the same period, Flag designed a number of mansions for very wealthy clients. This one on Fifth Avenue was for R. Fulton Cutting. The R stood for Robert. And he was a wealthy patrician who made his money in sugar beets. He was also someone who was very socially conscious and cared about people who were less well than off than himself. The hospital, the, the hospital, the house was originally, uh, was demolished in 1962. Next slide. Cutting probably chose Flagg to design his mansion because of Flagg's work designing uh, buildings for how to house poor men. Um, this one here is Mill's house and it was the first of three. He took a lot of care to design rooms that were small but very airy and as well as public spaces for the men so that they could have a certain amount of dignity. The going rate was 32 cents a room per night. On the left is a photo of the courtyard during a party. The building is now called the atrium and has been converted into market rate apartments. Next slide. One of um, Flagg's most important commissions was the Corcoran Gallium Gallery in Washington, D.C. It's a striking, robust building. It has a large, <coughs> rounded corner just with an exhibition dome gallery just off the uh, entrance. Flagg's sister Louise married Charles Scribner, the publisher, and 
Flagg designed the company's first headquarters on Lower Fifth Avenue. And on the right is in the other Scrib built, Scribner building, the bookstore by Flagg at 58th and 5th, circa 1913. He also designed a townhouse for Charles and Louise Scribner on the Upper East Side and another one for their son, Arthur. Next slide. So you have to squint a little and look at this photo and imagine more trees and a few scattered homes for the wealthy as it was in the 1890s, just a wooded hilltop. It was about this time that Ernest Flagg met George Cromwell, the first borough president of Staten Island and a resident of Toad Hill. In 1897, Flagg bought a large plot there and started to design a house which he call, would call Stone Court, since it sits on a large deposit of stone. This was a turning point for Flagg as he became more interested in American architecture and moved away from European styles. His new house was Dutch colonial or French Huguenot. The local stone found on Toad Hill inspired him to echo the colonial stone houses found on Staten Island in the Hudson Valley where many Huguenots settled. Next slide. His house was on the top of Toad Hill and this Sanborn map gives us a good overview of the entire flag property. On the lower right, you can see George Cromwell's property and the Ernest's property stretched from Flag Place on the bottom to Coven Coventry Road on the top. Over the next 20 years, Flag would design uh, not only the stone court, which is circled in red, but a lot of dependencies or adjacent buildings um, in the entire um, piece of property. Next slide. This is a very early photograph of Stone Court. Um, you can see the Dutch gambrel roof. In this case, it has several um, slopes. Some, most are two, but this was uh, more uh, ambitious. The stone walls are white, whitewashed, and there's an interesting round widow's peak at the uh, top, and these large chimneys. Um, we can see at least three of them. And we'll see in later works, Flag. this was a signature of his um, work. He loved big chimneys with ventilator caps. The low wing on the right is a swimming tank or an indoor pool. This is the rear of the house and it has a stunning view of the water. Next slide. This is a plan of the house and, and adjacent grounds. Um, the top of the slide is the water view with the veranda and the terrace and all of these um, ramps and stairs. Um, the actual house is sort of modest. It doesn't have you know 20 rooms. There's a dining room, a hall, a billiard room, a sitting room and a swimming pool. Um, but the rear of the house has a very kind of majestic Beaux-Arts feel because I think um, Flagg wanted to uh, highlight the view of the water. Next slide. These are two photographs of the interiors taken um, close to the time that they were uh, completed. On the left is the entry hall and on the right is the sitting room. And between the three windows uh, in the sitting room, there are two fireplaces. Um, this was a room that had three sides open to the elements. And I think um, Flagg wanted to make sure everyone be, would be warm. The decor is very uh, much uh, of the period. Next slide. This is a contemporary photograph and you can can see that there have been some modifications to the house. Um, some of the um, whitewash has been taken off the stone. There have been uh, two um, porches added at the on the second floor. The colonnade has been uh, changed somewhat, as well as the roof line. Um, the house is still 
intact, although there have been some changes. In 1947, when Flagg died, the house and grounds were purchased by the Society of St. Charles Scalabrinians, an institute of Roman Catholic priests who provided pastoral care and religious advice to Italian immigrants. The society built a new building adjacent to Stone Court and continued to operate as the St. Charles Seminary for Boys for many years. In 1964, they established the Center for Migration Studies. Recently, the society has attempted to sell the property. Next slide. This is the front door of the um, Stone Court and the side buildings um, have been added later. So if we kind of imagine that there was some plantings and this fountain uh, with a circular drive, it was much more formal, uh, unlike the service entrance that it looks like today. Thank you. Next slide. S Almost immediately, Flag began to build other structures on the property. Um, the earliest one in 1899, was a gardener's cottage. And the slide on the left, the small building on the right with the little cupola was part of, was the gardener's cottage. Um, it was modeled after Huguenot houses on Staten Island. And <clears throat> two years after it was built, the local Moravian minister, unaware that Flagg had designed it, told him the house was 250 years old. Flagg must have been delighted that he had been able to create a real Dutch house that fooled the locals. The later gatehouse, which we see a little bit of through the gate, but uh, more on the uh, slide on the right, was designed in 1908 or built in 1908. And we see that in these both structures, we see the evolution of his um, design from the grand to the vernacular. The, the cottage, the, the original gardener's cottage is part of a, the stone wall that uh, encloses the property. And we see the, his ventilators um, in the right hand side, the big chimneys with the ventilators. Next slide. <clears throat> These are some drawings in Flagg's own hand. Uh, we see this lovely rendering on the left uh, an elevation on the right at the top, which is the um, gatehouse building. And the elevation on the bottom shows the original wall and the gardener's cottage. Next slide. Um, Flag also built a water tower slightly higher than the one we see. Uh, but certainly something that anchors the whole um, property. Um, on the right is toward the rear is the palm house. This was a greenhouse that um, was built to weather um, delicate plants over the winter. It has two enormous chimneys on either end, uh, which seem very oversized, but Flagg wanted to make sure that this greenhouse had plenty of warmth in the winter months. Next slide. This is the stable. Originally, the stable was two stories high, and you can see the, the, um, the original roof line on either end. The Scalabrinians um, added a third floor, and that's what we see here. Um, it's one of the largest outbuildings in the estate, and it is mostly intact. Um, it's a private residence. Uh, currently. And we're very fortunate to have so many of the original buildings of the um, Flag Estate, which gives us a sense of the whole ensemble that he had envisioned. Next slide. Flag had a concept that um, part of the wall should be used, as he did uh, in that early gar Gardner's College uh, cottage. Um, and this is Bow House, um, 1916 to 18. It's called Bow Cot because it, it's hard to see, but the house actually bows um, and is part of the, the 
original stone or the, the original wall of the um, estate. Um, on the uh, right, we see the interior, which has a very lovely garden. And this is um, his direction where he's starting to really look at the design of small houses for the average person. Next slide. Walcott is the second wall house. Um, and he was experimenting with cost saving design and construction for affordable housing. Uh, again, it's part of the uh, exterior wall. On the top toward the peak, we see something that he will use again and again, which are roof windows. They're not skylights. They're actually windows that ventilate. Um, the, the actual second floor windows are, uh, we can see, as well as the first floor windows. He, these stone walls of the house are actually stone. They're not veneer. So they were about 14 inches thick. They provided incredible insulation. And that together with the um, ventilation made these houses um, green 200 years, nearly 200 years before energy conservation was a goal. This house was built for his only child, Betsy Flagg Melcher. Um, and she and her family Following in her father's footsteps and her mother, uh, she was an accomplished painter and miniaturist. Next slide. Both Bocott and uh, Walcott were Flagg's entry into development. And shortly after he came to Staten Island, he began buying property. And it, by 1918, he, he owned 200 uh, acres of Toad Hill, making him the largest landowner in Staten Island. He opened his own stone quarry to provide material for his building. And he had an envision of a, a what he called flag rich ridge estates, which would be like this Norman village, um, little small affordable cottages. It never came to fruition. Next slide. Oh no, not, not next slide, sorry. We need to stay here. Um, in, in 1923, McCall's Magazine um, had a competition or they basically uh, commissioned eight architects to design plans for small houses that were beautiful and convenient for the homemaker. Clarence Stein, Ernest Flagg, Amar Embry and five others submitted designs. Flagg's design was the least costly and the best design. The following year, he would build this demonstration house for all to see. He kept a detailed record of all the labor and materials and the house was built for $5,179.66 or 41.4 cents per cubic foot. He eliminated cellars and attics, minimized, minimized hallways, used casement windows for better airflow he used this local serpentine or soapstone for the mosaic rubble we see on the walls. He saved money by substituting concrete blocks on the corners, you may see that, instead of having stone finished on both sides. Today, this house is privately owned and you can see his roof windows, his chimneys, two of them. Um, and it's a wonderful example of where he was going uh, with the small house. Next slide. In 1922, he wrote a book called Flag Small Houses, Their Economic Design and Construction. And there are a few um, drawings from the, from the book. On the upper right, we see his roof window, which was very clever. It was actually two windows. It was a hopper and an awning and it allowed air to pass through without getting rain or snow inside the house. Um, the bottom uh, rendering just shows a, another one of his wall houses. In, he also developed um, a inch and a half interior wall by having a kind of uh, network of jute just you know, kind of uh, strings that went from floor to ceiling. 
And then two plasterers would plaster each side and they could see each other so they could plaster um, without it falling on the floor on the other side. And that was an inch and a half thick uh, wall that was soundproof, fireproof, and very strong. Next slide. In the 1920s, although Flagg never got to build his Flag Ridge uh, estates in Staten uh, Island, he did hook up with a Milwaukee builder named Arnold Meyer to build houses in Milwaukee and near uh, by Whitefish Bay. Um, Meyer was so enthusiastic about his houses that four of them were built for his own family. Only 25 were built and most have survived. An example of Flake's vision for an economical and well-designed community of homes. You can see his uh, signature, the stone chimneys, this one completely stone with the vent, this one also, his roof vents, um, his kind of um, picturesque style, um, and they're really lovely. Uh, there's a whole website devoted to them um, if you're interested in uh, getting deeper. There are also four in Richmond, Virginia, um, some very small and some a little more elaborate. Um, any of these flag houses today are in great demand and they fetch very high prices when they come for sale. Next slide. This is Effingham, the Junius Brutus Alexander home. It was built sometime in the 1840s, maybe 50s, for a woman named Agatha Meyer. It was a handsome Renaissance revival building that's been altered but retains its stately presence. Alexander was born in Virginia. Um, his family were among the earliest settlers, so, and actually the town of Alexandria, the city of Alexandria is named for the family. His grandfather, William Alexander, had a plantation and owned enslaved people. Originally, Alexander grew tobacco, but at, by the end of the 18th century, the land was depleted and they turned to other crops. The grandfather, William, named his plantation home Effingham. Junius's parents moved to Kentucky where Junius went into banking and became a bank president. He also married a woman from a Virginia, prominent Virginia family. And then they relocated to St. Louis where he established a wholesale grocery business and became the president of the Exchange Bank. He bought land for railroad companies um, and made a great deal of money. After his wife Lucy died in 1864, he cashed in and moved to New York. In 1866, he remarried Eliza Newcomb who was 25 years his junior. He bought the stately house on Staten Island and named it Effingham after his grandfather's plantation home. And he and Eliza had two children together, Junius Brutus Jr. and Maria Louisa. Next slide. That's the Richmond County Country Club. Just <laughs> I'm gonna say <laughs> that. Um, this is a photo by Alice Austin. Alice Austin was a friend of Maria Louisa uh, Alexander. And this is, you can see the, the sort of Italian aid or Renaissance revival uh, characteristics of this house. Um, by uh, 1883, Junius was not in good health and Eliza wasn't, the marriage was souring and Eliza wasn't uh, happy. She asked for a separation and she finally got one in 1890. Junius died in 1893 and there was no will. So the children of his first marriage brought an action to prevent Eliza and her children from having any share in the estate. And because she'd previously surrendered her rights with the separation, there's no evidence to exactly what happened, but it appears that the children got the estate and she wasn't included. She was living with her son Junius in 1900 in Staten Island and she died in 1912. And she's buried in the Moravian Cemetery in Staten Island. Next slide. This is the Billyu Stillwell Perrin House, known for uh, the three families who owned it over the years. Um, it's the oldest standing house in Staten Island, and it was built by Pierre Billyu. 
the original house is not the one with the red shutters, but the one behind. And we'll see a better picture of that uh, on the next slide. Billy Yu was a, no, I don't want the next slide yet, sorry. <laughs> Billy Yu was a uh, French Huguenot from Flanders and he fled Catholic persecution and came to New Amsterdam in 1661. He erected the original stone portion. He founded Oudorp or Old Town and his daughter Martha inherited the house with her husband, Thomas Stilwell. Now we can go to the next slide. So this is a, uh, a picture of all, all of the house uh, additions. The uh, one with the dormer windows was the Stilwell edition, the stone Stilwell edition. The, the other stone one to the rear was Pierre's and the wooden ones to either side were done by the Perrins. And there's a wonderful um, plan done in 1932, probably through the uh, Federal Artists Project, uh, part of the WPA, um, which shows the sequence of the various additions to the house. Uh, the, the Stillwells um, sold the house in 1758 when it was purchased by the Perrins or the Perrins. Um, they, uh, during the Revolutionary War, the, the, there were um, uh, British soldiers that were uh, garrisoned in the house and uh, apparently people think that they stole gold, um, which might be true because Mrs. Perrin had a lot of silver and gold, which is you can find in her will. Um, after the war, they were the, the Perrins were uh, Tories. They didn't support the uh, revolution. Uh, she petitioned the British Crown for money because the soldiers had destroyed some some things in the house and her trees and so on. I don't think anything ever came of it. Um, some people like to think that the house had a ghost named Mary, who was a woman murdered while walking past the house. If she is, she's a friendly ghost who perhaps has preserved the house all these years. Next slide. The Perrins sold the house in 1913 and sometime between 1917, 1923, Alice Austin and Gertrude Tate um, operated a tea room. And you can see this is a photo by Alice Austin of their little tea room. Um, ultimately, the house was landmarked in 1967 and it's been partially preserved by the Richmond Town um, County Savings Foundation, Historic Richmond Town, and the Staten Island Advance. And on the right is a photograph of a new roof being installed recently by Steve Lobato at no charge for his labor, and he raised money for the materials. So Staten Islanders really care about their history. Next slide. This is the Gillette Tyler House. It began life as the Gillette House in Enfield, Massachusetts. Uh, there's a photograph of it in the early 20th century. Gillette was a local woolen manufacturer and this was a quite um, you know, substantial house that was built on the Swift River Valley and it sat about hundred feet up above the, the uh, river. Gillette descendants lived in the house until the 1920s when the uh, Hobin Reservoir and Dam were proposed on the Swift River. Enfield and three other towns would disappear once the dam was finished and was filled. Before that happened, an enterprising young man from Dorset, Vermont named Charles Wade identified a number of important buildings in Enfield to be saved. He moved the first con congregational church to Dorset, as well as a number of other homes and other places. Here we have an original bill of sale for the Gillette House to Charles Wade from Alice Gillette Phelps uh, in 19, I think it's 30, 20, I can't make it out, uh, but it was for $300 and he was to move it to Staten Island. Next slide. The, the um, William Tyler uh, was the uh, person who eventually uh, got this house. He was an executive in a chewing gum company and was living in New Brighton. His mother and aunt had already had Wade 
uh, relo to relocate two houses to Dorset. Tyler's mother star alerted him to the Gillette house and Wade purchased it for $300. Wade had always relocated houses uh, intact, but with the Gillette Tyler house, he was unable to bring it on a roadway as the Verrazano Bridge did not exist yet. So he photographed the house. He, demo he didn't demolish it. He dismantled it carefully, labeling every board and piece. And it was reconstructed by a uh, contractor in Staten Island, a local contractor. And even the granite steps in the front of the house were moved from uh, Enfield. When Tyler, uh, after Tyler bought the house, he got a local architect to put on an addition, which uh, we see a little bit of on the right. Um, it was James Whitford and he designed actually an amazing addition that uh, could have been built at the time of the house. He really was very careful in uh, recreating the period. The house was uh, owned by the, the um, Tyler's until 1931 and it's been in private hands ever since. It's an elegant example of mid 19th century Greek revival stately and simple with a New England restraint. The three bay front facade has Doric pilasters and a recessed entrance flanked by two ionic columns. It's typical for the front facade to have the wide uh, flat clabbered and the, um, the lesser facades to have the, the narrower, less expensive clabbered. The Gillette Tyler House was landmarked in 2007 thanks to efforts by the Historic Districts Council. Next slide. The New North Moravian Church um, was uh, founded, actually the church was founded in 1457 in what is today the Czech Republic. The spiritual leader, John Hus, was burned at the stake and his followers broke with Rome decades before the official reformation. In the United States, the Moravian Church um, attracted uh, many Germans and Dutch, um, and this church was organized um, in 1763 on Staten Island and is the second oldest congregation in Staten Island. The first church building erected in 1763, we can see um, in the left-hand slide at the rear, that sort of very simple, uh, almost Greek revival building. The current church in the front was 17, was erected in 1837, designed by Jason Cropsey, a local architect and painter in the Hudson River School. Originally, it had a bell tower, and uh, it was in the 50s, it, the bell tower was replaced with a steeple. Um, the slide on the right is the Parsonage, about 1870. It's a very nice example of Carpenter Gothic. It's a simple Carpenter Gothic, uh, but we can tell by the uh, fretwork over the um, window and um, roof and the brackets on the porch. Uh, it's been, it seems to be very well preserved. And these um, kind of carpenter Gothic elements were made possible by the invention of a scroll saw in the mid 19th century. Next slide. Cornelius Vanderbilt was born on Staten Island uh, in 1794. Um, he descended from Dutch settlers who came from the town Derbilt in Amsterdam. And so in Dutch, von der means from von Derbilt. He was, um, he began a steamship company and later um, a steam, well, he started with a steamboat company and then later a steamship company and then became immensely wealthy as a um, railroad magnet. He was a member of the New Dorp Moravian Church, and he helped finance the 1837 church. Many of the Vanderbilts, uh, his, his children became Episcopalians, but he stayed with the Moravians. On the left is a portrait of um, Cornelius Vanderbilt by, of all people, Jared Flagg, Ernest's father. 
Next slide. Vanderbilt donated um, money to the Moravian Church for a, a cemetery. Um, and part of the, uh, the donation was that it would, they would have land for a private Vanderbilt mausoleum, which we see here. It was designed in 1886 by Richard Morris Hunt, uh, who had done several Vanderbilt residences. It was inspired by the chapel on the right in uh, Provence. Um, the uh, Staten Island mausoleum is placed into the hill and we can, most of it is underground. So we can see just the stone facade and the domes. Uh, the grounds uh, around the mausoleum were designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central, with Calvert Vox, designed Central Park and um, Prospect Park. They, Olmsted also did the landscaping for Biltmore in North Carolina, a home built by George Washington Vanderbilt, a grandson of uh, the Commodore. The mausoleum was designated a New York City landmark as recently as 2016. Next slide. Next, we have a series of slides of distinctive private homes, most of which were built in the early 20th century. The homes we're gonna see are characteristic of the houses built for wealthy people between 1900 and 1925 in America. They were much larger than the average homes of the time. There were more rooms and they, they had formal dining rooms, billiard rooms, sitting rooms, large sitting rooms, parlors, ballrooms, sometimes and many bedrooms. This Loop Road Dutch Colonial um, is a, uh, features these two twin, um, projections um, where with a porte cochere in the middle. And we can see that the house has changed very little from the tax photo of 1940. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a uh, magnificent structure. Next slide. So here we have the Charles Jarvis Fay house. Um, on uh, Roma Road. Charles Fay was a uh, prominent New York City lawyer and he engaged Amar Embry. We might remember him because he was one of the architects of the McCall's uh, competition. Amar got very uh, entranced with Dutch colonial houses and even wrote a book about them. Um, and this is actually one of the nicer um, Dutch colonials. It's it's not overblown. It's a rather um, simple house, uh, not um, modest, but it, it's, uh, it has a presence. Um, we can see by the floor plan, you see on the top right, there's a kitchen, there's a dining room, there's a hall, um, there's a living area and a study, and then bedrooms above. The house has been uh, substantially altered. Uh, but it, it, in its original form, it had the Dutch gambrel roof, it had these wonderful set in second story windows um, and the eyelid, uh, eyelid uh, windows on the top floor. Uh, but the, now you would be hard pressed to find this house within the um, alterations. It, it's there, but it's, uh, it's been sort of buried. Next slide. Um, this isn't a great slide, but it's a nice uh, Dutch colonial uh, two-story stone house. It has a, a, a simple peaked roof, not the, the Dutch gambrel. Um, it has these nice little uh, projections um, and it it's a lovely setting. It has an immense circular drive and some very, very old um, trees. It looks like it's been very well cared for. Um, Next slide. Um, this is uh, a Tudor revival. Um, it's specifically kind of derived from medieval or post medieval English styles of the 16, 1700s. It was very popular in the early uh, part of the 20th century. Um, and in fact, it became known as Stockbrokers Tudor. Uh, referring to the people who bought it and could afford 
poems uh, of this sort. It's got a stone base, which looks to me like the local stone, uh, and then the half timbered second story and large overhangs that give it a certain very substantial look. Next slide. Um, this, all, this are, there's a question mark as to the date of this house. Um, it might be 1899 or 1925. It's a Greek revival um, that actually is characteristic of Greek revival from the South, where the two-story colonnade with the porches uh, was useful to keep uh, people from, you know, sitting in the hot sun and also bringing the breeze through. Um, it looks like it's been fairly well cared for and it, it might have had a couple of additions, um, but it's a, it's a wonderful, very uh, simple Greek revival house. Next slide. Uh, another Tudor revival, um, a little, I think a bit larger than the first one we saw. Its main characteristics are these incredible brick chimneys. It looks like it's very well preserved on the outside um, and is a fine example of the, the Tudor style. Next slide. Oh, what happened to the picture? What happened to our picture? <laughs> there was a picture of the, oh dear, sorry about that. There's a picture of this uh, Coptic Christian church our Lady of Zaytun, formerly St. Francis Friary. So all we have is the interior and I can't tell you what happened to the exterior, but it got lost somewhere. Um, it's, not a, um, it's not a defined style. It's kind of what I would call um, mid-century ecclesiastical, kind of red brick, um, so on. It was constructed in 1927 as a Franciscan Friary. And by 2014, the, um, the order, the Franciscan uh, had shrunk. There were very few of them left and they decided that they needed to sell it. They were getting older. So they put the friary on the market um, and they decided to forego a higher price in order to, that they might receive them from a developer. Instead, they wanted someone who would, con would continue the religious purchase purpose. So they found the Coptic Christ Orthodox Church that was looking for a home. And this was a wonderful beneficial outcome for both the Franciscans, the Coptic Christians and the community. And it's a wonderful end to a tour that there's a building that's saved and is being used as it was intended. We have one more slide. Next slide. So we're gonna end with Ernest. He's a bit older than at the beginning of the tour. And I really love this quote of his. One of the best ways to economize in buildings is to economize in ugliness. Nothing can be greater service than avoiding ugliness than a knowledge of the principles of design. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I just want to mention that Toad Hill, Duncan Hills, can be reached by the Staten Island Ferry to the Staten Island Rapid Transit to the Jefferson Avenue stop. There are also express buses and buses from Brooklyn, or you can take a drive across the largest suspension bridge on the Western Hemisphere and follow your GPS. And we'd love to see you here um, in the Toad Hill, Duncan Hills neighborhood of Staten Island. Thank you both so much. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can put it in the chat below and uh, we can answer them. I hope you do more of these on the Staten Island. This has been so much fun for me. Um, having lived in Westerly, I'm 83, the, the baby of five children. You know, thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you for joining. It's great. <laughs> uh, and again, we have lots of um, other six celebrates 
on Staten Island. So please do check out uh, all the walking tour guides we have. If you're trying to ask a question, it's hard to hear. If you could put it in the chat, that'd be more helpful. Oh. Got a couple of thank yous. Thank you. Um, okay, well, if that's all, uh, I think we will sign off then. Uh, okay, so thanks for visiting us. I, I love it that you came to my neighborhood and uh, visited our beautiful houses. And after the pandemic, I hope I can do that real live walking tour and that you'll stop by my house for a cup of coffee or a drink or something. So that's my hope and dream. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, someone asked if we have other tours on Zoom. We have uh, a lot more tours on Zoom. We please check that um, on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to check that out. It's just Historic Districts Council on YouTube. Um, and as I have been recording this, I will send out the link to this video when it is ready as, well as the presentation and all of the uh, slide notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jean. Bye. This was great. Thank you. All right, have a good night, everyone. Okay. Bye, all.